Hello there, I'm Black Bright. And if you are, if it's the first time you're visiting my channel, please subscribe, like and share. And you know when you subscribe, it has a little bell. And if you click on it twice, you'll get the option to see all or occasional. So you can, you have a choice. So you don't have to be bombarded with any of the videos. Anyway, um, today I thought I would talk about profiles because profiles seem pretty harmless on the surface. I mean, we have our WhatsApp profiles, we have Facebook profiles, we have profiles for, like I do, because I'm a DJ, have a profile for uh, Mixcloud, I have profile for Facebook, profile for Instagram, and we all have um, profiles. And when we put up a profile, without thinking about it, we're telling other people about ourselves. Um, indirect, well, it's not even indirectly. I think we do it consciously because um, it's our way of attracting people who we know. So if you've people from school, say, for example, who you may have lost touch with, you tend to be a bit open. So you might put your name, you might put your area and stuff like that. I'm a bit skeptical about putting my age in my, my true location. I don't really put that because the age is what people use for, um, you know, when they're asking you security questions. So I don't put that on there. But a lot of us, we do, we put down, and when you think about Facebook, it has your friends, it has your relatives, it has your, um, you know, a lot of people that you know. And everybody, even those, I mean, I have 5,000 people on Facebook, but I don't know all those people. I probably know about 25% of them personally. The remainder is through music and whatever. The fact of the matter is all of those people are privy to my profile. When you think about what, um, what people can do with profiles, I mean, let's think about the online when you're applying for a loan, for example. When you're applying for a loan, you'd, what you don't realise is that you're creating a profile for the financiers, for the people who are going to loan you money. So they get a picture of the type of person you are, whether or not you're reliable and that kind of stuff, based on the questions they ask and how you've answered. They've built up a profile. When we have our smartwatches, what they call wearable technology, when you put in there your age and your weight and you want to know how many steps you've done. So you put in um, maybe, I don't know if it does your heart rate, but you put in, in you put in basic information, you know, and on top of that, you have to put your location in when you're doing your walks and stuff. That's another profile. It's a restricted profile, but it's a profile all the same that garners up information specifically for you so it can respond to your specific requests the same that's the same way facebook works you build up a profile on facebook and you'll find that you'll have adverts that come up on your page based on what you've put in that profile so where am i going with this um i saw well i saw something um that kind of struck struck me and it was to do with i'll tell you what it is the digital panopticon have you ever heard of that well i've never heard of it until now but they call it now the panopticam as in camera and i'm going to read it but the basic setup of Bentham's Panopticon is this. There is a central tower around, surrounded by cells. In the central tower is the watchman. In the cells are prisoners or workers or children, depending on the use of the building. The tower shines bright so that the watchman is able to see everyone in the cells. The people are in the cells, however. The people in the cells, however, aren't able to see the watchman and therefore have to assume that they are always under observation. This kind of freaked me out a little bit. 
I'm going to read some more of it because, um, yeah, I'll let it speak for itself. The Panopticon Legacy is a metaphor for human surveillance and came out as long ago as the 1920s. So as long ago as the 1920s, people or humans were under surveillance and invisible surveillance. Um, as a work of architecture, the Panopticon allows a watchman to observe occupants without the occupants knowing whether or not they are being watched. As a metaphor, the Panopticon was common, commandeered in the latter half of the 20th century as a way to trace the surveillance tendencies of disciplinary societies. The, pr the principle is central inspection. The French philosopher Michel Foucault revitalized interest in the Panopticon in his 1975 book Discipline and Punish. Foucault, spelled F U C A U L T, used the Panopticon as a way to illustrate the proclivity of disciplinary societies to subjugate its citizens. He describes the, prison, the prisoner of a Panopticon as being at the receiving end of an of a sorry he describes a prisoner of a panopticon as being at the receiving end of a asymmetrical surveillance he is seen but he does not see he is an object of information never a subject of communication as a consequence the inmate polices himself for fear of punishment so what this is saying is that it just reminds me of the society that we're living in. And if I use, I mean, we have to use how we live, the society we live in, as symbolic of the tower. We're all being watched, but we do not know that we're being watched. Or we know that we're being watched, but not on what scale we're being watched. And I spoke of the profiles because... We are, we are sharing information about ourselves and in essence, we're, we're actually giving consent. If we think of the GDPR, which is the, um, the EU thing that is supposed to protect us, that requires our consent. The GDPR sets out seven key principles. And it's a collection and it's used for the collection and processing of personal information and individuals within the European Union. But the thing is, is that people aren't collecting this information when we put up our profiles. We are actually offering our profiles for free by us putting up in that information, whether it's on Facebook or social media, whether it's on our watches whether it's on an online application for a loan or a mortgage application, we are offering our profiles and they're quite explicit because they're for a specific person, purpose. And when you're filling up an online application, whether it's for a credit card or whatever, you're not thinking to yourself, oh, I'm creating a profile, but you are. The GDPR sets out seven key principles, lawfulness, fairness and transparency. Um, of course, there's always exceptions with the police. They'll use it for, um, what you call it, protecting society and that kind of stuff. Um, national security and safeguarding. They'll use, they can share information because of children and adults, vulnerable children and vulnerable adults. Purpose limitation. This should only be used for a specific purpose. So when we put our profiles up, we're putting up just to show our mates or our friends how we look. Sometimes, you know, we beautify how we look and we are, you know, as far as, our, as, far as we are concerned, we are sharing information to people that we know or even people we don't know, depending on our business. And assuming that that, information is going to stay where it is. Um, data minimization. 
when um, we put up information or when we give out information. That is supposed to be the minimum required. And that is all they're supposed to use. The absolute minimum required to do the job. And, you know, when you think about the DWP asking all of these questions, going over the top, they're not supposed to do that under GDPR. They're only supposed to ask for what is necessary for them to give you that particular benefit. Same with the home office and the visas. You, you tell your whole bloody life story for a visa. That's not how it should be. Um, accuracy, of course, the information you have is supposed to be accurate, storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality and accountability. So that is GDPR when you're thinking about say, security of the information that you put out with your profiles. Um, I'm going to read some more because this panopticon gets deeper. It raises the question, does the fact that we don't know we're being watched mean we are being normalised in the way the panopticon was intended to correct behaviour? The panopticon, the occupants, are constantly aware of the threat of being watched. This is the whole point. But state surveillance on the internet is invisible. There is no looming tower. No dead eye lens staring at you every time you enter an URL. The thing is, is that it's subconscious because we know we're being watched. We poo-poo it because we say we're doing nothing wrong. So we poo-poo it. But it does affect what you say and what you share. Because at the back of your mind, you're always thinking, I wonder who's going to see this. I wonder where it's going to go. So subconsciously, we are being controlled. We're actually, but no, we're not being, we're actually policing ourselves. We're actually behaving in a way exactly what that is saying. That we are self-correcting because we know that we're being watched. Of course, you have the juveniles who don't really give a toss. But the majority of mature adults are actually policing themselves. Um, there may not be a central tower, but there will be communicating sensors in most intimate objects. And you know what I also heard? They've also got sound algorithms. They put them in, they're putting them in schools. And what these sound algorithms are supposed to do, they're like cameras, but they detect sound. And they're supposed to detect aggressive, they're called aggressive detectors. And they're supposed to, if there's, you know, somebody in the, in the, if somebody bursts into the school and, you know, tries to shoot all the pupils, it's supposed to dictate that and send an alarm out. But what's happening is if somebody coughs, it translates that into aggression or if some, you know, people are having fun or screaming, they, it translates that into aggression. And when somebody is aggressive, it's not picking it up. So it's not doing the job well. But it's costing 22000 They've got it in quite a few schools. I don't think they've got it in the UK yet. I don't know. Because with the UK, they're so discreet and subtle. We don't know what they're doing. Um, the principle is central inspection, Schofield says. You can do central inspection by CCTV. You don't need a round building to do it. Monitoring electronic communication from a central location that is panoptic. The field... The real heart of Bentham's panoptic idea is that there are certain activities which are better conducted when they are supervised. In many ways, the watchtower at the heart of the panop panopticon is a precursor to the cameras fastened to our buildings, purposely visible machines with hid human eyes hidden from view. It's quite spooky. The parallels between the panopticon and CCTV may be obvious, but what happens when you step into the world of digital surveillance and data capture? Are we still objects of information as we swipe between cells on the smartphone screens? A government communication head Q, HQ proposal that, hold on, a government communication HQ Proposal that would e enable eavesdropping 
unencrypted chat services. I think that should be proposed actually. Government, well, it's GCHQ proposed that would enable eavesdropping on encrypted chat services. Anyway, what that's saying is that um, the GH, the um, GCHQ wants to um, eavesdrop on encrypted information. What they want to do is to blind copy all of our messages, basically. So if I send a WhatsApp, we don't know it's been blind copied to, to, the, to, the, to the government or who else. This is what all this is about. Um, ghost protocol. A, a GCHQ proposal that would enable eavesdropping on encrypted chat servers has been condemned as a serious threat to digital security and human rights. The proposal was first muted by two senior intelligent officials, Ian Levy and Technical Director of the UK's National Cyber Security Centre, and Crispin Robinson, Head of Cryptanalysis, the technical term for code breaking, at Government Communications Headquarters in November 2018. They would use a technique that would avoid breaking encryption. Instead, requiring encrypted messages servicing to, in effect, CC or blind copy the encrypted message to a third recipient. This would turn a two-way conversation into a group chat where the government in is the additional participant or add a secret government participant to an existing group chat. I mean, that is kind of spooky, don't you think? I mean, I know they say they're doing it for terrorist threats and stuff, but they have to know who... They must know who's doing all of this stuff. I mean, they must know what kind of... They should be able to screen certain people. People's uh, WhatsApp... And Facebook and Instagram should not have messages that are blind copied to a third party and we don't know about it. In an open letter signed by more than 50 companies, civil society organisations and security experts, including Apple, WhatsApp, Liberty and Privacy International, GCHQ was called on to abandon it's so-called ghost protocol. The ghost protocol is the blind copying or the CCing, whichever way they want to call it. And instead focus on protecting privacy rights, cybersecurity, public confidence and transparency. But you know when this stuff comes out, it's already done. You know, they make it look like, okay, they're going to try and stop it. It's probably already in force. I tell you so. my WhatsApp is playing up something stupid these days. My phone, it jumps all over the place. And it does make me wonder. It does make me think, you know, is somebody intercepting my phone? We, apparently we have zero privacy, so let's get over it. A strong emphasis on privacy rights could be used as an effective marketing tool as well as an important compliance obligation. Yeah, so I did start off with the... Um, profiles because the, everything is linked how we share information about ourselves quite innocently quite naively we have to curtail that we have to edit the information that we're putting out there and only put what's necessary what you don't mind getting into other people's hands I used to have my phone number on, on Facebook and I'd get these people calling me, some men calling me all hours of the night, telling me about, oh, they, they, they like the look of me and all this crap. And I'm like to myself, how dare you? I put my number on Facebook, not for that purpose, not for any random person to call me. It's on there so that people can send me music if they need to for my show. So then I took my um, the, the number off 
and they can still call direct through this FaceTime or something. I don't answer it. I just think it's, to me, it's an invasion of privacy. And that's another example of how people can actually invade you when they have certain information on you. So you really have to be careful, peeps, what you're putting into your profiles. And bear in mind when you're completing forms that you're actually building a profile for a third party. That is what you're doing. And we don't know what they do with that information afterwards. They're supposed to shred it, but we don't know what they do with it. And we don't know who they share it with. So you really need to be careful. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.